now just be showing you what he is all about and how easy it is to take your body oh, yeah. and make it look nice. Um, I'll just start out here. You know, first of all, here's our website. You can see this is an example of the kind of images we make. Um, this is actually a more complex scene than a lot of you are going to be making, you know, more often than not, you just want to see your product in, in ray tracing so you can see what the lighting looks like, just like on it. So also in the gallery here, you know, plenty of relevant examples, marketing images, you know, other things like this. And we'll just get right into it, showing you how to, how to make these images. And I'll show you a couple of things later on the uh, platform and things like that. You can minimize this. And go right into right to to Keyshot here. Key shot here. Okay. I'm saying the uh, audio is bad. It's bad. Let me do what I can do here. Okay. Okay. Let me, uh, let me call in on the phone. Not in the top of the hole. Uh, Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, he's gonna if you if you didn't hear what he said, he's gonna call in on the phone and hopefully uh, clear up some of these uh, audio issues. So bear with us one moment, please. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me know in the uh, questions if there's still any problems. Uh, but uh, really, really, that sounds better. So I have some people saying it sounds good, some not. Much, much better. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, I'm going to put it on speakerphone so I can have my hands free. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get down to it. So we have um, Keyshot here, and right now I have one of our preset, our pre-made bits loaded. And you can see it's real-time ray tracing, which means just going through here, and we have accurate lighting based on a three-dimensional uh, three image or an HDRI image that's basically a sphere wrapped around the model. And you can see reflections of the model. You can see the reflection of the environment here. And what I'm going to do is clear out the scene and start fresh with a brand new model. So, in fact, I'll just close Keyshot here. I'll show, show you right from the beginning. Keyshot 64. Here we are. And this is our blank scene in our blank studio environment. File import or the import button right here. I'm going to navigate over to a model here and bring in this stapler removal, uh, staple remover. And when you import some data, you get some options like merging with current things so that you can add models and things like that. So this, I'm just going to click OK. And there it is. And right now, this is a model coming out of Maya that just has some default materials applied to it. And before I move on to the next step of actually applying materials, I'm going to quickly rotate this model so that we get it into a more proper orientation. I do this by just opening up the options menu. And I'm already in the right tab here, the scene tab. And I can click on my staple remover and go to my rotations. And in this case, I know I need to rotate on the x-axis, just 90 degrees. And of course, I can go in and add a little extra rotation or open up the actual move objects manipulator here by right clicking and just easily modify its position there. Something about like that's going to work. 
then of course I can snap that to the ground so that we have it kind of sitting on the ground. Let's bring that down a little further. And there we go. So that's it for moving the, the object that's going to work for the rest of the scene. And of course you can go in and be more precise and get all the points touching the ground. But that's just fine like that. I'm going to go ahead and close my options menu just by pressing the space bar and open up the materials library. And here we have all of the pre-made materials that we include with Keystrat. And for most of your projects, these materials are going to work just fine. You can go in and, and go into subcategories like plastics or metals. And when you find a material you want to use, you just simply drag and drop it onto your model. And it applies. You'll even notice that as you drag the material onto different parts of your model, if you don't let go of the mouse, it actually will give you a preview of what it's going to look like. And if you're not happy with it, you can just leave it over in the, in, in the uh, library. So this one looks good. It actually has a texture on it. So we're going to worry about modifying that texture and make it look a little better later. Um, but let's go ahead and find a plastic for the rest of this. Plastic. And you can even search in these categories. You know, I can put in black. That'll, that'll find basically my black plastics. And I can increase the size of these thumbnails so I can see what I'm looking at. I can just drag that on there. And for this model, that's about it. That's all I need the uh, materials library for. And so I can move on to the next step, which is looking at some different environments. You can see currently in the startup environment, you get these kind of reflections, a very soft studio, so we don't get a lot of nice, sharp reflections. So if I just click environment here, I can browse through all of the pre-made environments that we include. I can try out some of these, and some of them are studios, and others are actual, actual uh, real-life scenes. So let's just try a couple of these. Dragging one of this, this is a more dark, dramatic environment. And you can see that if I zoom out, we can look at some of the light sources in here. For example, this uh, large panel of light is actually going to create some very interesting reflections on my model. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for an environment that creates some nice reflections. So let's say I want to compose an image something like this. Then that reflection there is nice. So maybe that's not exactly the camera angle I want. Maybe I want to change it up to something over here, and I don't exactly want this reflection, well, I can just use a hotkey, which is control left mouse button, to rotate my environment around, and I can find a new reflection. If I zoom out here, do that same hotkey, control left click, you can see how the environment's actually rotating. So I'm just going to bring my camera in and look at that some more. and create some nice lighting effects this way. Speaking of hotkeys, you can actually press the K key to get a list of all of the hotkeys that are relevant. So for example, environment, control, left mouse, drag is a rotate environment image. Let's try out a couple different environments. Let's bring in the factory here. This is a nice environment for when you want to create sort of industrial look. You can see some of the lighting effects here. We have some nice bright points of light on this one. You'll also notice that you have all of the reflections and lighting being, being based on this image alone. And that includes the ground shadow. So if I bring in a, an environment that has a uh, nice sharp sun, it will actually cast a nice sharp brown shadow. And you can see how there's a shadow being cast from these wings up here down onto the ground. Now, if I bring in a soft studio environment, that shadow becomes much more diffused. And we don't have those sharp shadows. So let's bring in a couple more here. That one's pretty nice. So let's work with that. Now, you can, of course, just stick with the, the standard um, environments, and you can, of course, modify them as well. But for now, let's complete this image just by using this environment and not adjusting anything. The next thing I might do is just go over to my backplates 
And there's some backplates in here that you can use, but a lot of them, these are actually all photographic ones. So let me bring in just a uh, more abstract one. So instead of going to my backplate here, I'm going to actually open up the options menu, go over to the backplates tab, double click on this little image, then I can go ahead and find my own backplate. We can use this orange one, but for this, since I don't have any color on the model, I might actually just use the black and white version. And you can see a nice abstract backlight, backlight like this can add some interest to your render. And you can position this just using the camera controls, which again, you can see all the camera controls by hitting K to bring up the hot keys list. Now let's say I wanted to make this a little more interesting by adjusting some settings. It's you know, it's very easy to just use all of our, our preset materials and environments, but sometimes you want that extra control. For example, in this model, you might want to adjust the texture on this on these metal pieces here. As you can see, the mapping actually coming from the modeling software isn't ideal. So I'm going to double click on this. And then you double click on the any part of the scene, it's going to bring up the uh, material properties for that part. And in this case, it's metal. And in addition to being actually does a texture and bump map apply to it. So what we need to do is that's a couple of things. And the first thing we want to do is just get our texture and our bump map at least to synchronize so that any adjustment we make is going to happen in both of them. Because in this case, they kind of correspond. There's a a, uh, a bump map that is based on the actual color map as well. So you have the uh, actual black and white lines here working with the bump map. So I'll show you the difference first before we move on to uh, adjusting the mapping. With the color map, let me just disable the bump map. The color map, you can just see the coloration of the material. You have darker and lighter spots. If I disable that, you just have a nice, clean, perfect surface. If I bring the bump map in alone, you'll see that it creates the effect of a bump on the surface. And you have here a bump height slider. And as I increase that, you get a more and more bumpy surface. In this case, we just want a really nice subtle bump. And we actually need to adjust the mapping of this bump map so that it doesn't have this sort of strange mapping along here. In this case, I'm just going to use a very basic box map and not worry too much about it. Just have to box and be done. The only thing beyond that will be to increase the scale a little bit. As you might notice, it's a bit hard to see right now. I just bring the scale up, and maybe the bump height up just a bit, you start to see that again. Now, also, this bump map is a, supposed to create a uh, brushed look. So it, it already looks pretty good, but one thing you might be able to do is stretch the texture out a little bit so that the brush the brush strokes are actually longer. The way we do that is disable keep aspect ratio. We just scale one of the scales non-uniformly from the other. So bring scale U down and maybe scale V up. And that starts to stretch out the texture so that we get a more uh, pronounced brushed look. Hopefully that's coming through the, the uh, webinar. Now, in addition to the bump map, we can enable the texture, which is the color map, by just clicking Enable. And you'll notice right now the texture is actually still set to UV coordinates, and the scale is still, still set to 0.5 and 0.5, while the bump map is set to a box map in 0.610 and 1.790. And in order to get those two synced together, let's just click Sync, and then we can just check this by changing the scale a bit. You can see how those link together now. So any change I make here, it will also be made here. But then beyond texture, we can actually adjust the material parameters. So for a metal, you have only a couple of parameters because the metal is rather simple. You have the color of the metal and you have the roughness of the metal. If I bring my roughness all the way down, you can see we have a nice sharp um, material. Now it doesn't look entirely sharp. You're actually getting distortion of your reflections based on your um, based on your bump map. So let me just disable that bump map and show you this a little bit more. 
with the bump map disabled, you can see this is basically a mirror surface. You can zoom out of it here and move this over here also. You can see how that's really a shiny reflective surface. We're catching the reflections from the environment in that surface. Now, if I double click again, make sure I'm on the right material, if I just increase my roughness, you can see how that starts to particularly blur that environment uh, and the reflections coming from it. And of course, the materials are independent of each other. So you have a nice sharp reflection up here on the black plastic, and you have a nice rough reflection on the metal. I'm going to bring it back down to maybe even more subtle than that. So let's do just point zero one. You can see how you can you can actually input really subtle values of roughness. I can even go lower than that, point zero zero five, even point zero zero one. You just get a nice slight blur. You'll see how if I go to zero, the difference there. Very slight blur. Sometimes is all you need. Then I'm going to bring my bump map back. Just bring this one here. We'll sync it back up to our um, color texture. And of course, this bump map looks incredibly bumpy right now. So I'm just going to bring that slider back down to a nice subtle level so that we get that brushed metal look. That's not bad. The next thing I might take a look at is this black plastic. It looks a little too perfect here. So again, we can go to our plastic material just by double clicking on the on the object. It brings up the relevant material. And the plastic material is quite a bit more advanced than the metal material in that you have a diffuse color specular and some transmission. You'll actually notice that in Keisha you can hide a lot of the advanced material properties that you don't often use, and they're actually hidden by default. And the way you uncover or or you uh, hide them is with these show advanced material properties option here in edit, preferences, show advanced material setting. So when I double click that we get a couple more options now. But basically when making a plastic, you just have to worry about diffuse color. So if I bring some red into the diffuse color here, and I set a level of red, we have now a red plastic. We have the specular color. By using a darker color, you get less specular. You can see if I turn it all the way to black, it's actually just a nice diffused, soft-looking material now. And if I bring it all the way to white, it becomes very shiny. And then beyond that, you have to control the IOR. And actually, this is one of our pre-made materials here. It has an IOR of 3 point something, which is a bit high for a plastic. So I'm going to put that back down to 1.5, which is much more realistic. And you can see now we can just easily control the color of this. We can put it to anything we want. Very simply, just change the material color. And of course, you can go back into the material library here. Clear out your search. If you can go through all of these different plastics, use an orange plastic, use a red plastic. You honestly don't have to do any customization if you don't want to. You can find yourself a white plastic here, a black plastic here. Let's just go with this orange one here. Now, one of the things about uh, the, our newest version at Keyshot is that we have a material that can actually more uh, perfectly represent plastic that you might actually be using, and that's our translucent material. So let, me make sure, let me see if those made it into this material library. Here we go. Translucent material library here. This is a new thing for 2.1 2. Uh, 2. version of Keyshot. You'll find these actually allow light to scatter beneath the surface, which is something that's previously been, been unheard of in real-time ray tracing. So let me just drag this. Uh, this material here. I'll just let that res up for a second. You'll really get the idea right away. You can see the kind of effects you're getting with the light scattering beneath the surface. And if it's not too obvious right now, if I just kind of look under the surface here, if this wasn't a translucent material, there would be no light coming through the surface right here. And we can see the levels of translucency 
by, by just adjusting the translucency slider in the material. Just like all of our other materials, we've made translucent material very simple. If I turn this down, or if I even turn this back to a plastic material, that's what it looks like without translucency. Totally dark. And if I turn translucency on and bring my translucency slider up, allows light to come through that surface. And of course the transmission color is actually what is the color of the light coming through the surface. So let me just bring that up to a much brighter, more pronounced color. And you can see I've set my transmission color to red and I'm getting a lot of red light coming through. And these materials can be used for a wide range of things like human skin and of course plastic. So and, and things like marble into a marble material here, letting light through the surface. And the, uh, basically the texture scene is actually produced procedurally, so it will always look right no matter how no matter what the mapping on your material on your uh, object is. You can put the human skin on here. The uh, graphics, the computer is telling me there is an issue. Must have to do with go to meeting and running at the same time. Let me see if I can get this to restart itself. Let's see. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sometimes running with this meeting causes some anomalies. Okay, let's get right back to it. I'm going to bring my uh, stapler back here. And you know, we know we just need to move this. And this will show you really how quickly this will go once you kind of know where everything is. <coughs> Bring that down to the ground level. Done. Materials. All. Plastic. Let's just bring orange onto there. And materials. Metals. Steel. There you go. And then click over to environments. HDR Light Studio here. And these are a lot of environments made in actual the HDR Light Studio editor software. Uh, we can try a couple of these out. I'm not sure which one I like best. This one looks pretty good. Okay. And then we'll bring our backplate back. It's actually saved into our library now since we used it last time. And there we go. So we're back already to where we were. So that kind of gives you a sense of how quick this can go. And let's get back into a couple more material things here. Um, like I was saying, we can bring a translucent material onto here. And one that we would actually use is something like blue tran translucent. It's a nice subtle effect, and we can adjust it as needed. Double click on that on that, and you can see the translucent level. You can see the IOR of the material. And just like every other material, you have the have the roughness slider. So if I find myself a reflection that's too sharp like this right here, I can go in and just like just like your metals material and just like your uh, plastic material, you just increase the roughness to soften that surface. And the higher I increase that roughness, the softer that surface is going to look. To the point where you can have like a really soft like silicone type look. And the translucency is really what that's about. Well. I just bring the brightness of this material up. Well, that just kind of rev up for a second. Translucent, translucent materials certainly are more render intensive than, than many of the other material types. But oftentimes, they're exactly what you need to just add that to realism. Um, here. Just like every material, you have very simple color reflectors. So I'm just going to make this orange. And it's red, reddish orange here. And bring my roughness back down to a nice subtle level. That's pretty nice.
Now, once you have your scene sort of set up, it's very easy to output your final image. You can use a couple of options. The first one is simply the screenshot option, which allows you to just think about basically exactly what you see right here. So once it finishes resing up, you just click screenshot. Or once you're happy with how, how long it's resed up, it doesn't actually finish. It'll, it'll keep going for as long as you allow it to. Click screenshot, save out a JPEG of your image, and if you just open up your library, you can actually see your renderings right here and open them up. And there's my rendering. Well, then the other options you have are to click render, and you have just a render options tab here uh, where you can put in the file format, a name for it, and a resolution in the pro version. This can go up to any resolution you want, 10,000, 20,000. It all just depends on the amount of RAM you have on the computer. But even on a small laptop with only four or six gigs of RAM, you can be able to do some pretty high res images, 10,000 by whatever. Usually it works just fine. So you can put in something like 1920, 1040, and you have actually basically two render modes here that you can use. You can use what we've had in the past, which is an offline render. And with that, you actually have to go in and set your render quality settings. This is actually kind of like your typical ray tracing software, where you have samples and global illumination quality and all of these settings that you need to tune in order to get a fast and high quality render. Well, what we've actually done, since we've put so much work into our real-time rendering engine, we figured why not just use the real-time rendering engine for your final image. So in order to do that, you just click use real-time render. Then when you go over to quality, you don't have as many options. All you have to say is, I want it to render for this number of frames, or I want it to render for this number of seconds. So I can put this up to, you know, let's just do uh, 15 seconds, which obviously isn't going to be enough. But when we click render, you'll see it pops up. And again, there's no limit to the render resolution. So it used to be, if you wanted a final render at a higher resolution, you have to use our offline render mode. Which isn't always ideal because you can't you, you may not be an expert on render settings. This takes away that necessity. Just set it to whatever resolution you want, and you let it render for as long as it needs. Once it's done, click close, and again you'll be able to see that right here in the rendering tab. And ten seconds or fifteen seconds or whatever it was wasn't enough for this render, but you'll uh, be able to adjust that as much as you need. A couple of other cool things about Keyshot that we've seen recently is the uh, certainly the effects options here. So you'll see if I enable effects, very subtle effects right now, but it's actually creating a little bit of a bloom on the surface or on the uh, image here. I can increase the bloom intensity and I can increase the bloom radius. And you'll start to see that in this highlight here especially, you're getting a bloom of light. So you get a little bit of a softer feel. And you may think you're limited to these settings, but I can actually type in 50, I can type in 500, and you'll get some crazy levels of bloom. So remember that with our software, you're not limited to what we give you in the slider. You can actually type in anything you, anything you need. You know, we definitely try to make our sliders the common ranges. Uh, but if you need a higher level of bloom or any other setting, just take it in and it'll give us you. The other cool setting here is the vignetting strength. Increase this, you'll notice the edges are darkened and it's a vignette. Uh, this allows you to create a nice image that actually targeting the edges will pull the focus of the, of the viewer in towards the center where your, where your object is. And of course with this, we'll typically use some more subtle values. So let me just bring this down, bring this up. We just have a nice subtle blur for, for our bloom, and we bring this back a little bit. Let's just create a nice image we can compare here. It's a little bit too perfect looking here, and just adding a bit of uh, GPU effects or effects here actually create a nice image. Another nice thing we've added is the ability to go into what we call performance mode. And you'll notice, well, on this computer, I'll show you what I'm dealing with here. We're, I have 24 cores at my disposal, and 
peacefully every single one of those to its fullest. On some laptops that only have maybe two cores or four cores, you might notice that some of your scenes are a little slow. And if that's the case, you can go into performance mode. You won't use performance mode for your final output, but you, a lot of times you're not looking for the full cores, you're looking to just move the models around, texture models, and things like that. And what's nice about our performance mode, which you tend to by going just pressing Alt P, what's nice about it is it doesn't go into any sort of GPU mode where you, where you have entirely different material types. It actually just lowers the quality settings of your real time render down to the point it'll run fast on basically any machine. You don't have to worry about the difference between a preview mode and a ray tracing mode. It's always ray tracing. It's just a much faster ray tracing because you lose things like shadows and brown shadows. And when you're ready for your, your full quality here, just snap, you just press Alt key and bring up your full shadows. Um, some of the other things here, like detailed indirect illumination. Detailed indirect illumination allows the light to really scatter across the scene and make it much more realistic. So if we enable that, that's going to actually split on render yet some more. But use all P, and it turns all that off automatically. You don't have to go in there and optimize your settings. You just switch between performance mode and not. That's very nice. And of course, we have some other cool things that uh, you'd expect in a, in a uh, with a digital photography tool like this. Uh, for example, in our camera tab, you have the ability to actually know exactly where your camera is. Let's say we want to make sure that negative 180 degrees are looking perfectly at the side. We can very easily do that. Type in 90, we're now looking at the back. In zero, looking at the other side here. Negative 90, kind of to the front. Then I can just kind of move the, the camera with my normal key command, you get any angle you want. And then I can go in and adjust my perspective. And this is actually a really cool slider. In the past, we have given you the option to use Alt and the scroll wheel. Basically, change the focal length. And if you're familiar with a physical camera, when you change the focal length of a lens, you're effectively zooming in and out. And that's what this does currently. This is your Alt scroll wheel command, which changes focal length or basically zooms which is different than actually moving the camera forward, which is Alt, left and right mouse drag. But if you wanted to just adjust the visual perspective or the sort of the distortion of the model, you can use the perspective slider, which will compensate, your, will compensate for your focal length and your distance so that adjusting your distance while adjusting focal length so that you get a model that still basically the same space, but you can change the distortion or the or kind of the vanishing point effect. So you can see if I lower this, we're getting lots more perspective, but the model still stays reasonably within the scene. And then let's say we want a really dramatic uh, image like this, but this is supposed to be a small model, so let's have them depth of field to give you that sense of scale. It goes to our depth of field, enable it, click pick focus, and then I can select any point on my model. So let's just focus right here on the on the uh, on the cause. And you can see the back of the model is now blurred. When you're finished picking your uh, focus point, you can just click done. Let's say we really want to exaggerate the Depth the field effect. We just, drag, we just scroll it down on the F stop. And the lower the F stop, the more depth the field you'll have, you'll have, or the more blur you'll have. And again, I can change the focal point of the depth of field. You can just click here on the back. And there we go. Now the front is in blur. That's a great way of just increasing the realism a little bit more. We'll just turn that off. Some of the cool things we have here in the camera tab that really help you compose a good shot is the, uh, the grid. The first type of grid we have is just a midpoint. So if you really want to just have a boring centered image, you can make sure that your model is right there in the center of the near time. If you want to go by the rules of thirds, you can then kind of compose based on that, and you can see these lines here. And they'll help you make sure 
just uh, the uh, thirds points uh, going for. Then we have quarters, and that gives you a lot of points to line up with. And just just pull that. Now the next thing I want to show you before we end this uh, this demo is how you can actually work with something in a real scene, like a car in a uh, a parking garage just or in a parking lot. So what I'm going to do is just go to File New, I'm going to discard my changes there, I'm going to pull a new model. Actually, let's hope I have that model. Let me see models. No. Okay. So what I'm going to do is import BIP, which has the model I want in it. This is actually an interesting thing. A BIP, of course, is the file folder that we save for QJOS so that you, you have all your environments and materials all saved in that, in that BIP so that uh, you can always come back to it. You know, it's a standard project. Um, but let's say you, you don't want to open that BIP because it has a lot of things set up. And then you kind of just want to get you know, the data from it and start fresh. We can import it rather than, in, rather than open it, you can import it like, like a piece of data. So I put my bits here. I see my Lamborghini zip. I'm just going to import that. That actually will bring in uh, basically the model, and that's all I was looking for. And, and the nice thing about it is it doesn't just bring in the model the way importing 3D data does. It actually brings in the model on any materials that you have applied or anyone else had applied in Keyshot before. So you'll see when I double click on the surface here, we already have this nice white metallic paint on here. Okay, let me let me bring the uh, resolution of the screen up a bit. In order to change the resolution or the, or the size of the real time render, just drag that like that. Bring the full screen here, of course, not the full screen. And of course, when you increase the size of your real window, it will slow down the performance. You might be able to pick up on that a little bit here. But don't do that. So let's work with the problem to fit into an actual parking lot. Uh, of course, we can go in and drag and drop some new materials. I might go to my style paints. Paints here. And a nice one. And orange. And we can go in and adjust some of these settings. And just make this group a deeper orange here. And also turn this down. That's going to give me a nice shiny paint, a nice clear coat. And uh, John, if you're going there, have to save materials. I will certainly get to that uh, right now. So. If you have a material you want to save, like this material, for example. This is, of course, just a modified material um, of one of the pre-made materials. And if I want to save it, I just go to my material here, and I can go to any material in the scene. Just double click, and then click the plus sign here. Clicking the plus sign then brings up this little key shot, scene materials window. Let me give it a name, orange paint 2, and tell it where to save it. I'm going to save this one into paint. That seems logical. Click OK. Now when I go to my materials, I'm in here in paint. It's not in that material library. Simple as that. OK. You, you can notice here, I've let this been sitting, this has been sitting here for a few moments, and it already looks great. You can see very nice reflections and highlights in this model. Even for this somewhat boring studio, it really does look nice. So, that's nice. That's we have a nice start to our render here. Now let's bring in some lighting in the back plate that's going to make this look a little more real, or as real as the model can look. Even if it's not the best model, but uh, we'll, we're all right with that. Okay, so what we're going to do is click environment, and let's see if there's anything here that's going to work. We could try a factory. You can really see how that factory brings out the clear coat richness of this paint and the metallic effect. Something that some of you guys haven't seen Keyshot, this is one of the first things we did with Keyshot that really uh, captivated the, the rendering world was how good our metallic paint is. And I'm just going to go off on a tangent here for a second on that. The metallic paint here, this material, has a great control of that metallic effect. You can see that metallic scattering, and we can control that with the, with the metal roughness and the metal coverage. If I bring up my metal coverage, 
I'm going to get more metal in my paint. You really see how that's looking more metallic. But if I bring up my metal roughness, it's going to spread that metal over the paint much more. So now it really looks like this dispersed um, metallic flake effect. If I bring my metal roughness down, you get a much tighter grouping of metal around the highlight. And basically, the highlights are going to bring out the metal. And where there isn't a highlight, you're going to see more of a base color. I sort of oppose these colors, like a green here and a blue here. You can feel kind of crazy effects you can get. And again, if I increase the, the metal roughness, you can really see how that spreads that metal out, decrease it, and it tightens it back up. And metal coverage is the ratio of the metal to the base. So at 1, we're basically seeing almost entirely metal. And at 0, we're seeing only base color. And that's actually a pretty cool um, Lamborghini paint right there. So I'm going to bring a little metal in there and make this complement that a little bit, make it a little more. There we go. OK. Now this environment's nice. And let me just see if I have a back to work with. Let's see here. You bring in something like this, position it on here. You can see this back plate works pretty well with the lighting. We actually have a lighting environment that will work even better with this. But you can see I'm just using the cameras to, to position the car in this, in this back plate. Now, one of the nice things we've done for you is, is uh, we've included in the metadata of the back plates the focal length, which for a lot of these is 28 millimeters. And what that tells me, it also tells you what model camera, which is a Canon 7D which tells me that taking into account the uh, crop factor of this camera, I need to use about a 50, uh, 50 millimeter focal length. So I'm just going to type that in, 50 millimeters. You can kind of just know that with our, with our back plates, go with a 50 millimeter lens. It actually starts to look pretty nice. All right. And then you can, of course, adjust focal length just a little bit. Maybe, maybe you don't need to perfectly match it every time. You know. So that's pretty nice right there. Um, but I actually do have an, a lighting environment that more perfectly matches it. So I'm going to load up my, get, get back to my uh, kind of off the screen here. There we go. Click my environment. And this backplate actually matches with the industrial backplate right here. And we're just going to rotate our environment until that matches. And it's somewhere around here. Now here's a cool thing you can do. You can toggle your back plate off so that you can see the environment. Just press B, and then you see the environment. Now, the gamma is actually something we need, to con we need to consider here. And this is getting a little advanced, and of course, I'm throwing a lot of information at you. Uh, but hopefully, you'll give Keisha a try if you haven't already, and see what you remember of this, and then get in touch with us and look at our tutorials and all of that, and we'll help you uh, along with your learning process of Keisha. But, but basically, gamma here. Uh, in order to make this lighting environment look a little less intense, I'm going to bring my gamma up. And this, this gamma is in the real-time tab. And there's another gamma and another brightness in the environment tab. And you have to kind of think of this as real-time is sort of a post-process. It's like you went into Photoshop and adjusted a photograph. That's the real-time image, uh, real-time brightness and gamma. In the environment, you're actually adjusting the world. You're you're changing the gamma of the of the lighting environment itself at, at the at the core of the lighting. So if I bring the gamma of the lighting environment itself up, we get softer lighting effectively. I'm going to bring that somewhere reasonably around, and this is totally arbitrary. This is where you get creative with your settings. You you uh, just try some things, see what looks right. So then I might just bring my environment this down a little bit. And I can actually use the, the um, arrow keys for that. You can see how that makes it a little more subtle. You can probably tell from this from this uh, lighting environment, we have a lot, a lot of light coming in from the right side. And I rotated the environment such that it, it uh, matches the back plate. So we have lighting coming from the right, casting a nice shadow into the car off to the left. And that's what we're looking for. And uh, so again, we can just move our, our camera around here. 
to get it to match, and that looks pretty cool. Now, I can load in my own custom backplate that we've made out of our actual uh, parking garage outside the office here. I can do that just by going to environment here in the options tab, double click, and go and find my environment. Rooftop, HDR. Now you're, you're going to see the lighting change on the car, but it doesn't change the background. This goes to show that we can you can have a backplate, and they don't have to perfectly match the environment. You can have any sort of lighting you want, any sort of backlight you want. Uh, but just before before we get into adjusting this um, environment, we're going to set the settings back to one and one. Just know we're at the at, at the base there for that. Now with backlight, I'm going to do the same thing. I can actually go up over to my desktop. And I think I have my backlight in here. Looks that way. Okay, that's good. So I have a backlight for this. So I'm going to click load here and navigate to that backplate, which is here in the backplate, or rather roof one, and load that in. It's a nice high res image, and so it takes just a moment to load, but one to ten. You can see that's starting to match our lighting nicely. To really show you, I'm just going to click this over to a perfect metal, or basically a perfect chrome. Right now it's all green. Let's get rid of that. So with a nice chrome Lamborghini here, you can really tell that we're in this lighting environment. And what I need to do is take a look at my backlight. I can see where the shadows are coming from, so I need to rotate this environment. I'm just going to use Control left click, rotate it around so that I get my reflections and lighting coming in from the right area. Now obviously this, this building here is a nice reference point for that. So if I, if I press the B key on the keyboard, you can take a look at where that building is. I actually don't have it matched up perfectly. So if I just scroll, left mouse button, I'm going to put the building about right there. And that's going to map it nicely. So you will have to understand that the HDR lighting environment isn't a perfect repl replication of your backplate. You're not always going to have the perfect um, reflections in the exact right in the exact right locations, but more often than not, it's going to be, going to be pretty close. So I'm going to use my camera here to adjust my car's location, and basically I'm taking the camera in and out, and that effectively changes the scale of my model relative to the backplate. Hopefully that makes sense there, because that's kind of the key to this. But you can tell you're catching a reflection of the building here from the environment in the hood of the car here. And that's great. It looks very nice. And we can actually go in and, and adjust this environment even more by going to the Environment Options tab. One of the nice things you can do is actually change the height of the environment. If I bring the height down, We'll see what effect that has. You're changing what you see in the car's reflections. I'm going to move this up here so we can see the effect a little better. If you bring it up, you're basically you can see you're getting more reflection of the ground in the car because there's more ground there. In this case, it's actually pretty much fine at zero, so I'm going to leave it there. And then I'm going to change this back to a paint, and I'll show you how to make a quick paint. Metal, change to metallic paint. Set your base color. Let's just do a nice blue, maybe, like a deep blue. There's your base color. Well, then we'll set, a, uh, we'll set the metal color here and get our settings in line. That looks nice there. I'm going to bring more saturation into it. Now, that could work. I'm not entirely happy with it. But that could work. I might even just bring this back to sort of dark. There we go. We'll bring the blue, the blue color in using metal. That's going to look pretty cool. Okay. So that looks pretty nice there. And one thing you can do, you can control the clear coat level by going to your IOR here and increasing it. You can see you get more reflection can really exaggerate the clear coat of a car that way. And we have a lot of other materials on this car that are actually creating a little bit too bright of an effect. So if I just double click on some of these surfaces, 
So that's our paint, but this little chrome should be a little thing to click on here. I should move my camera in a little bit. Let's see. That's actually just convergence of light there, so that's nice. I might double click on my rims here and darken them a little bit. So we have a nice dark rim, and we can increase the roughness on them. And that roughness is going to soften the harshness of the environment's sun. But this, that is what we want in this scenario. We want that harsh sun because that's what was, that's what was happening that day. We had a nice, bright, you can see, perfect, clear Southern California sky there, which is maybe, uh, you know, this, was, this is what it was you know, a week ago, and then this week we have thunderstorms. So but, uh, that's what it was then. Um, and basically, we can go in and adjust whatever we need to do. We can add roughness to any of these materials. We can change up materials. We can apply new ones. You can take a look at anything here. Um, and, it, and it really does do a good job. You just bring this down in color a little bit. And it starts to look like a, like a real photo. You know, another thing you could do, certainly, is take this car, rotate it around, and put it in a parking spot. Very simple to do. And once we've done that, we need to just rotate the lighting so that shadow them actually shines on the correct side of the car, right about there. And what you might notice in this scene, actually, is something that's also new for Keyshot, the ability to adjust the color of a shadow. So I'm just going to make the car a little bit abnormally large so we can really see that shadow. And we have a perfect reference for what kind of shadows we had that day. Right here on the wall, you can see a very clear blue tint to it. Um, this is going to be the last thing I'm going to show. So in order to get that blue tint, all I have to do is go to my shadow color and increase the color. I'm just going to set to a blue to bring this up. Of course, I'm never going to go up into these ranges because that's going to basically cancel out my, my shadow. So I'm just going to use a nice style like that, and I can add more saturation if wanted. That's just match that to the to the environment. That starts to look pretty cool. So that's about it for Keyshot. There's certainly more to do and lots of cool tricks that you can learn. Um, but that's really the, the basics of it. And, and I hope you could see that you really can do a quick image just to see what your product looks like in a matter of a couple minutes. So. We're going to take a look at the questions and, and uh, try to help you out with that. Thanks, everyone. Am I cutting off this question and answer? What am I doing? All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, let's see. We usually do a question and answer session here. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Brian has been uh, answering some of your questions as we go throughout. Uh, I know that there's some questions out there that Jeff wants to answer. Um, so let me get him to respond to some of these. One moment. Okay. Yes. So poking through here, let's see. And I have Brian here with me. So Brian, do you have uh, some of the what are some of the best questions here? If you uh change the chrome on the will the film material will be modified to longer. Right, that's a great question. So basically if I have a, if I bring in a material from the library, let me just show that. Um, I can open up my library, I can apply a material here. And that applies the material from the library, but it actually exists within the project independent of the library. So you have your um, you have your uh, library materials. Once you're in the project, you can you can step into whatever you want, and it's not going to change the library. Now you do have the ability though to right click on a material in the library and click Edit Material. 
And I will warn you that this change will actually apply to the library. Let's click Continue. Let me adjust that. You can actually adjust to the library. Once I apply that, that adjustment's been made. And so let's see what else we have here. Okay, just really quickly again, how you rotate your shadows, basically. That's with the control, left click, and drag option. And that's rotating the lighting environment around your model. And so you can use that to match that to your back plate. And you can see with a bright sun like this, it really changes the, the look depending on where the sun is coming from. When it's in shadow, it's a much darker paint, and the sun really brightens it up. Uh, the type of computer I'm using, um, I'm using today is just a uh, an Intel-based. Uh, basically, it's using i7s, and they're well, they're the newer type where there's uh, six physical cores on each on each CPU, and they're hyper-threaded to have 12 on each CPU. So it's a pretty serious machine, but we're always very proud of the fact that we do most of our demos at trade shows, and when we go out to uh, customers' offices, we actually usually do demos on laptops because it runs just fine. It's really optimized to work on any hardware you have. And of course, we will never require some uh, impressive GPU that costs several hundred, several hundred dollars up to over a thousand dollars. So you uh, just use your CPU, and it will work. Will work great. Okay, maybe one or two questions more. Architectural rendering, um, interior-wise, our software isn't honestly the most optimized for, for interiors. Uh, the exterior, you know, all, all it's about is applying a light, some lighting and doing some good texture work, and that would work just fine for that. Um, interior-wise, we do have global illumination and all that, but if you want perfect quality, it will take a long time to render. And uh, adding lights is a bit tricky, so it's not you know not necessarily the best tool, and it's something we're of course looking into. And let's see. Speaking of applying lights, um, we do have, and this will be probably the last question, unless there's one more really important one. Um, basically, you can apply an emissive material. So if I bring in um, something like this test models and have a plane in here. Here we go. Okay, if I bring in a model and I say merge with current scene and click OK, you can see I have this plane here. And I can set the, the material of it to emissive and then increase the intensity. It will actually cast light onto, onto my model. And one of the coolest things is I can actually move this. I can put this over here, just kind of put it off to the side here. And you can see it is it's casting light onto the model. And I can actually hide it from the camera. So visible to eye, turn that off. And there's our um, light coming from the plane, but hidden from the camera, so you don't have to see it. Okay, and that's, it. that's going to just about do it. Uh, of course, we are happy to stay on the line for a few more moments and answer the rest of the questions just with the keyboard here. Um, and any other questions you have, feel free to contact us at support at loxion.com. And also, you can take a look at our forum and start talking with our users there. That's here, keyshot.com slash keyshotforum. Of course, you can get there just by going to keyshot.com and the button right here, forum. So a couple of ways to get in touch with us, directly email us, support at lexion.com, or keyshot forum. All right, thanks again, everyone. I hope that was uh, useful. All right.
Thanks a lot, Jeff. Really appreciate that. I, I want to apologize again for some of the technical difficulties. I do want to assure you that that was Jeff McCartney from Luxion and not uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, I know it sounded a lot like Stephen Hawking through uh, a portion of that webinar, but it was actually Jeff. Um, I want to thank everyone else for coming out today, and another thanks to Jeff and also to Brian, who was answering a lot of questions there. Uh, you just participated in uh, a portion of NoVeg's The Best of the Best webinar series. Uh, like I said in the beginning, um, we're the e leading online design superstore. Not only do we have the best prices around, but uh, our friendly and knowledgeable staff is, is literally only a, a chat or a phone call away to answer all of your, uh, all your questions. And, and I know that I, uh, I promised a, um, an announcement at the end that I think would be to the benefit of everyone. And so um, here it is, 50 bucks off. Right? If you enter the promo codes that you see on your screen, um, you get $50 off not only for pro, but for standard as well. Um, the offer is good up until October 25th, so you got five days to get $50 off our best price um, of KeyShot Pro or KeyShot Standard. Um, I'd also like to draw you uh, draw your attention to another uh, bit of info. That's a, it's probably going to be to your benefit as well. Um, we here at Novec continue to go above and beyond for the design community, and we've created a, several um, online communities that foster collaboration and communication between design professionals. Um, one such community that you may already or may not be familiar with is is called Rhino Jungle. Um, if you're not already a member, it's free. It's easy to sign up. takes about two seconds. And, and when you have signed up, you'll get instant access to all the latest info, trends, news, videos, tutorials, events, and much, much more. Um, a lot of the uh, – I don't know if Jeff is, but I know that a lot of the, the um, tech help at Rhino and, and other um, uh, 3D modeling companies are members. Um, and that are literally only uh, a message away from getting a hold of, and they're very active in um, collaborating and communicating with other 3D professionals. Um, if you have any questions about this webinar or comments, concerns, um, feel free to shoot me an email at frank at um, You can see my, my email there. To stay up to date on the best of the best webinar series, you can also go to www.noveg.com slash webinar series to stay up to date on uh, what we're doing in this bi-weekly series. Um, our next webinar is going to be uh, Designing in Vectorworks Landmark 2011, and that's going to go down two weeks from now on October 20th. Um, that's, that's about it. Thanks again. I think uh, Jeff and Brian are going to stay on for a second and, and direct chat uh, um, a couple of your questions. So thanks again for coming. We'll see you next time.